Um, so uh, I'm in a unique position here. I was invited by Fred to come in. He sort of pulled me aside at a symposium we were at a couple of months ago. I talked a little bit about a program that I've been running at Virginia Commonwealth University. And he asked me to come here and I think he probably did this with everyone, asked me to be provocative. So I'm gonna try to do the same thing. Uh, but the unique position I'm in is uh, we don't have an NRT. We don't have an IGERT. We are hopefully actually one of these case studies that you've been talking about. So uh, pressure's on. Um, I like to start off with, and I wish we kind of all did this for each of our speakers, went around to talk a little bit about our history. Um, where do we come from? I'm, um, my disclaimer here is I'm an evolutionary geneticist. And so I think of everything in the past as being really important to informing how we make our decisions and what we do. Uh, so I got my undergrad BS at University of Delaware. The interesting part here is uh, years later, as I was applying for jobs, out of all the mundane things that you could look at on a CV, uh, the vice provost of the university that hired me said, can you tell me about this minor in philosophy that you have? <laughs> and at the time, I did not realize that being a biologist and having a minor in philosophy was probably counterintuitive. But uh, this start off, I'm also going to throw in there that I was working on oysters. You'll see a weird trend here. Uh, and that there isn't one. Uh, Stony Brook University, I got my PhD in ecology and evolution. I share this with, uh, with Fred. Uh, Fred, two things, uh, many things have changed since you were last there, but it's no longer called SUNY at Stony Brook, and they're no longer the Patriots, they're the Sea Wolves. I have no idea what that is. Uh, <laughs> but I worked on Drosophila in my uh, PhD. Uh, I then went on as a postdoc, and I was an Igert postdoc uh, many years ago. Uh, University of Maryland in College Park, and uh, this was a consortium that was built at Howard, GW, Smithsonian, I believe also NIH. And uh, moving from Drosophila into working on developing a human evolutionary biology grad program. Quite an obvious jump there. And as a postdoc, it was my job to be at least one class every uh, one of the three years I was there to be teaching at each of the universities, to be interacting with students at each of these groups, a very diverse group of individuals. Um, I then got a job at Arizona State University. I was there for almost 10 years. Uh, I was the director of the multi-concentration grad programs. It's like, we really want to have interdisciplinary, but we're not committing to it yet, I guess. Um, I was also assistant dean of School of Life Sciences undergraduate programs. We had 3,500 students for, maybe you don't know this, ASU, 75,000 students in the country, so, uh, more than um, small states, uh, 110 faculty. Unique experiences here that I'm trying to get at that really gave me insight into running grad programs, working with different cohorts of students, working with undergraduates, working with graduate students, um, training as faculty. I was a National Academy's Education Fellow in Life Sciences, going off to boot camp for a few days to learn how to teach again. Uh, and then finally uh, to Virginia Commonwealth University where I'm currently the director of the Center for Life Sciences Education and also the director for our Integrative Life Sciences Doctoral Program. I throw my header up here in that I completely understand what students go through today as being an Igert fellow and having to go through is that I show up somewhere and the statisticians think I'm a geneticist, okay, which I'm really not. Uh, the geneticists think I'm a statistician, which I'm really not. And the human biologists think I'm a human biologist, which I'm not. And so what are you? It's these labels that people want to put on you when you integrate across these fields and yet, it's hard to get hired when someone put, wants to put a name at you. The first thing I did at VCU, I walked into the human genetics department, which is in the medical school, and I said, hey, I'd love to teach classes. I'd like to work with your individuals. I have been on multiple NIH grants, NSF grants, as collaborative research. And they said, so do you have a degree in human genetics? I was like, no, I worked on Drosophila. I'm a population genetic. like, well, then we don't want to work with you. I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick conversation. So. Um, there have been a lot of national uh, uh, data sets that have been talked about in the last few days. Um, uh, Terry brought this up. Uh, I didn't hear anybody talk about specific statistics, the Council of Graduate Schools. This is their publication that came out in 2017, which I thought was uh, fairly unique about this, is this is asking questions to students themselves and looking into program directors. Uh, if you're not familiar with CGS, it is represented by uh, 100, 500 different programs, which usually are headed by deans uh, that are, are, are responding to questionnaires, but we have students and programs. 857 respondents in this 2017 release. Less than half, look at this number, less than half 
of the students described their programs as preparing students for a broad range of careers. Okay, so the students saying this, who cares what the faculty think? 20% of programs focused only on academic teaching and research careers. We've heard this in the last day or so. Faculty that are asking you when you're coming in, do you promise me that you're gonna go into research when you're done? Because if you're not, I'm not interested. 44% describe programs that serve graduate students through a single unit fo focused component. Okay, that's not even close to majority. So some of the things that Terry did mention here as moving forward, students need more informed selections of PhD programs. Okay, this diversity. More effectively engage faculty in conversation about career paths. What faculty think are career paths is very different than what students think. Provide an important measure of student success and program quality. And I think what Terry last said here is being more transparent. Talk about improvements of student career preparation and student outcomes. So here we are. We talk about what this looks like. This is what this looks like. It's kind of ugly at first. But let's follow through some boxes here. And who starts this? The person at the top up there. The president at VCU, Gene Trani, which is now has a life sciences building named after him. And they also have his like, number retired in the basketball arena. He never played, but I have him up there um, when he retired. President Gene Trani in 2001, when he came in, said, we need to have more flexible and bridge-like programs. And he understood that you cannot house these in colleges. You cannot house these in departments. And then you're gonna see the president's not up here, okay? Provost, vice president of research and innovation. So follow this down. I, I'm at the bottom, of course. Um, I am the director of the blue box over there for Center for Life Sciences Education, which houses the Integrative Life Sciences doctoral program. I report to a vice provost who reports to a provost. Also in this unit of life sciences, we have these green boxes, which are research centers that have academic programs. They can provide tenure. They have tenure track faculty and instructors. We have a center for environmental studies, which has a program um, masters and masters without thesis environmental studies. We have bioinformatics uh, program, which is a masters and a professional science masters, uh, which comes out of our center for uh, biological complexity. This yellow box is we have the facilities, which is the Rice River Center, which is situated along the, the James uh, River. I'll also note here that I, when you have things this crazy, lots of dotted lines, I also serve as an associate vice provost of all graduate programs and that the program directors from different units, and because I'm one of them, it makes it easy, report to me and discuss funding and how curriculum operates. I then also report to the vice provost of academic programs at the university. So when you wanna know what that structure looks like, you're right, when times get thin and how money goes and funding, but this has to come from the top. President Trani came in and said, I want a program that bridges between our medical campus and our main campus. That's what started this. And I don't want it to sit in any spot because you all can't get along. And so I don't want anybody to be in control of this. I want it up here. So he uses words like matrix administration. Okay, how I get to kind of float above groups. I have tenure. I'm also a, 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 an associate professor in Department of Biology, but this is where my home is. So my administration, my teaching, and, and notice I have zero faculty down there. I'm gonna say that again, zero faculty. <laughs> so uh, we have over 80 uh, students that we have recruited into this program. Our first class was in 2004 uh, in 20 different departments or units across campus in life sciences that I have placed students. Faculty do not exist in my unit at all. The money is given to me in order to be able to recruit students and place them into different departments. So this is our, here we go right here, student learning outcomes. These are aligned perfectly with what the Council of Graduate Education, uh, uh, sorry, Council of Graduate Schools, uh, oral communication, uh, I can't even read my own writing, written communication skills, uh, experimental design, problem solving skills, integrated knowledge, these are student outcomes. These students are in the Integrated Life Sciences PhD program. We don't recruit them in and then place them into their own departments where their faculty are. They are all together in this unit. 
Ah, yes. Flexible. I swear this was all written before today. This is all we talk about is flexible. Why do students want to come to this program? Why do faculty like it? Why does the president so in charge of this? Flexible curriculum and structure. Student-centric. Students drive the decisions. Faculty, we think we know what we're doing a lot of the time. We provide guidance, but the students are the ones that are in charge here. You have research advisors chosen from any research unit across any of our campuses and is matched to an applicant when they come in. I meet with each of the faculty one-on-one -on -one when a student is in the pool or they have recruited that individual and you are matched to that person when you come in. The student has a contract that says that coming in the door. The funding is then given to that faculty member to advise that student. I'll get to that later. You have a research committee, which has at least two members with primary appointments in departments other than the research advisor, so that faculty has to get along with those people. Again, this is not a predetermined box of faculty that you choose from or that are assigned to you. You can choose anyone. You want to choose someone in urban planning, policy, go for it. At least two outside of your primary advisor's department. Departments are for faculty. Programs are for students. Core courses, that's it. Two credits of an integrated life sciences research class that I teach every fall where all the students are in there from that cohort and we go over topics of how to choose a, a, a committee, how to write proposals, how to collaborate. We talk about integrative science. A student seminar, which is run by the students, meets every Wednesday. No faculty are allowed in there. Oh, I know, innovative, right? No faculty are allowed to attend. Students run this on their own. They get to talk. Research seminar in integrative life sciences. I also teach this course. It's where students have to go to other units and write up summaries of those seminars and critique them the way that they would be critiqued for their own talks and their oral presentations coming up later. I provide them feedback back on that. It's teaching them how to see other people's research and be able to interpret and learn from themselves. That's your core. What is that? two, four, six credits up there, okay? After that, choose whatever you want, okay? So this whole, like, I don't have faculty thing, this works here, okay? Who's teaching these courses? These are courses that are already being offered in a number of different programs and units all over campus. You have to have a technologies and policy course, two credits, pick one. Scientific integrity course, one credit. Some advanced stats class. Below that, courses in career development, proposal writing are encouraged. Directed research, yeah, you gotta do research. And outreach efforts. They are required to have at least one outreach effort a year in any capacity whatsoever. So I thought a lot about number of people constantly talking about trees, 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 and oh my goodness, as an evolutionary biologist, this is all I think about are trees. So uh, tree of life, uh, I, you know, rarely do you get to put up a reference as like, you know, 1859. Uh, so Charles Darwin, this was the only figure that he published in his book, the only figure. There were no page charges, okay? It was a very long book. It's the only figure he had. But in this 630 class, this Life Sciences 630 class that I teach, one of the things that we do, we don't have them working on a single project together that's predetermined. They are working on their own projects in their labs, but they come together each week and talk about their individual projects so they can each learn about what are the common threads they're moving through their projects. So when I think of a tree, I think of the integrated knowledge. You have a common ancestor at the bottom of your tree and you have these lineages that grow from it and knowledge is integrated and moves back and forth. And I have students that sit in there and they talk about their research on gut cancer, landscape genetics, carbon cycling, life sciences, broad fields, and thinking about what are the common threads that move through each of your disciplines. And if I were to ask all, ooh, if I were to ask all of you to do this and to uh, give me what you think are these threads, these students right at the beginning, the origin of projects, they th see things like gut cancer, landscape genetics, carbon cycling, how energy flows. What are the dynamics that have uh, cells in cancer as alleles move across a landscape in genetics and how uh, diffusion of gases? They're thinking about the principles that kind of bring those ideas together. This is easy stuff. These are, it's not science that happens in silos. So you're not gonna like this one, okay? This is a paper that came out in Nature a few years ago. I'm surprised no one br brings this up. Interdisciplinary research has consistently lower funding success. So for everyone in administration, um, this is what you uh, might focus on. 
But there are some interesting quotes that come out of these studies. Uh, research evaluation, and this has been said, research evaluation systems with a narrow range of measures of success. Okay, lower funding success, well, how do we measure this? For example, number of primary research publications. Blah, 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 this has been said. May disadvantage interdisciplinary. Establishment of collaborative networks for data sharing agreements. Another quote, interdisciplinary research can also incur substantial cost. These are not costs. I found this interesting that the authors of the paper interpreting their own data are calling these costs. Owing to the need to invest significant time in doing what we do, or supposed to be doing, collaborative relationships, developing a shared language, and honing a, a common perspective from disparate viewpoints. Wow, I mean, this sounds like every problem that we have in this country right now. <laughs> Provide a way of identifying highly interdisciplinary proposals that might require special evaluation strategies, such as, oh, I don't know, seeking reviewers who have experience in doing this. This is the challenge of this. We are asking students to do things that the evaluators are really not even trained in. And then they're assessing them and saying, you're not really doing a good job. So I'm gonna beat on this a little bit and show you some of these products that come out of our unit and our students. We have a student that is involved in a collaborative with, we have the number one fine arts program in the country. And collaborating with them, designing films. And this is the winner of the Environmental Film Festival in the state of Virginia at us little university, uh, VCU, which by the way is the largest university in the state of Virginia, um, not UVA. Uh, <laughs> An oyster's eye view of the Virginia Oyster Shell Recycling Program. These are students that are working with the state and environmental programs to be putting shells back in the water for recruitment. A film that was designed by one of our students it won this award, and this is how we're getting back into communities. Ron Lopez now teaches a course for students across the entire campus. Who are the students in this course? Film students from the art program, okay? You sit down with people, how do we do this? You teach students to inquire about diversity and expectations and deliverables up front. I traveled down to St. Croix last week to start a project. Yes, it was all work, I promise you. Um, sat down in the very first thing in meeting with individuals there to start up a project on internal conservation genetics was what are the things that you need to get out of this project? And it was interesting, the head PI of the entire project working on the Ocean Foundation said, you know what? No one's asked me that question before. Um, I don't require publications. I'm like, okay, then let's figure out what we need to do from the beginning to make sure that we're both meeting our needs. Here's another uh, deliverable that comes out of this. Uh, coming up with art and figuring out how to communicate our science, right? Not results until you can get out there and someone else understands it. Look at some of these projects that these students are having to develop and think about ways to get their work out there in publications. We have courses that we've developed in working with arts to do this. So I'm going to give you a little sort of vignette here really quickly about focusing not just on students all the time. We're recruiting students, but some of my talk here is sort of underlying the idea we really need to focus on faculty and admin too. These are the people who are making decisions and training. So big questions like, coming out of my lab and, and building as faculty, interdisciplinary research with my background kind of comes very obvious. I like to teach students to take the one thing that you know how to do very, very well. This has come across multiple times, jack of all trades, master of none. Take the thing that you know how to do very, very well and walk it to somebody else and explain it to them and show them how it can help their research. So big problem, how is growth of urban areas impacting natural resources, biodiversity and health? This is a interdisciplinary solution, okay? It's the intersection of ecology and evolution, engineering, sociology, public policy, urban management. From the ecology perspective, you can go all night and day talking about how urban uh, 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 growth is declining species riches. There have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers published on the negative impact that urbanization has on biodiversity. To my right, you have from population genetics sort of central dogma about as urban fragmentation increases on the x-axis, moving from left to right, you have genetic variation within populations goes down, and you have genetic differentiation between populations goes up. Groups become different from each other because of this fragmentation on the landscape. We're losing genetic variation. However, I bring students into this problem 
from different backgrounds. And the first thing they look at and go, hey, can't there be other examples here of where species actually do well in urban environments? Can't we be looking at their models? And then you have faculty say, no, we've published a thousand papers that have already said that that's not the case. Students come in with this fresh mind talking to each other, develop this idea, and said, if we focus on adapters, we actually flip the central dogma over here. I don't know what the opposite of central dogma is, dispersed dogma. Uh, <laughs> Urban fragmentation as it increases, right, you actually have genetic differentiation going down because there's urbanization is actually facilitating gene flow due to human-mediated transport. We're moving organisms around in many cases. We're bringing in GIS specialists that are doing great jobs, of, this is our professional science masters, of learning how to be taking aerial uh, uh, video and data and plotting that and figuring out how to map that with genetic variation. This is my social uh, uh, network analysis here, which shows that as we're working with individuals to think about what are hubs of urbanization and looking at these models, thinking about, you know what, sometimes cities are not all contributing in the same way to urbanization and the socialization and biodiversity breakdown. This is important for management decisions. What are the deliverables that came out of this very costly effort? We published a roadmap for urban evolutionary ecology. It's coming out in New Phytology right now that has about 20 international authors on it. We put together an RCN that I just submitted about three days ago, the re-revision. All of you cross your fingers. Um, Research Coordination Network with 44 international collaborators. We brought on uh, multiple alt LTR sites that are allowing us to work, bringing networks of urban individuals from all over the, all over the world. Finally, I want to make some comment about integrated programs. Scream diversity, okay? If you can't recruit diversity into integrated programs, you are doing something wrong. This is diversity at every level. I don't find this difficult at all to be attracting individuals from different underrepresented backgrounds. I've actually started a scholarship at the university with the graduate school down there that talks about how we're bringing individuals with economic diversity, age, gender. Uh, I brought in three LGBTQ students this year under targeting and thinking about recruiting. Students want to do this. Now, I know the bold part up there. You're really going to like this part. Guaranteed five-year support with graduate and research assistantships for every student in the program when they come in. I'll just pause. Okay? That's what it obviously takes. I have a president on board, and I have a unit that floats above others that no one's fighting. Okay, so real quick, diversity, location, location, location. I do a lot of recruitment locally. There are students, I mean, I know some of us always talk about, you know, you got to get away, you got to get out. This is a new age. Students in underrepresented uh, uh, and, and, and city and urban areas, a lot of them actually want to stay. That's not a problem. I'm recruiting to the students and trying to create positive reinforcement about them being involved in this network. Collaboration. Graduate students are the glue. They are. They're the ones that drive our research. When these programs go away, faculty can't find the time or the effort to come up with, with, with these interactions. Grad students do it. I'm going to go back to what Fred said the other day. Not all programs see it this way. I have had really nasty, nasty phone calls where I tell them I'm going to start recording them if they keep calling me. From biochemistry chair calling me and saying, uh, Dr. Varela, I heard that you just promised one of my faculty a five-year support. And I'm like, yes, you're welcome. <laughs> and threatening me, telling me, if you keep doing that, I'm going to go to the provost. And I was like, good, because she gave me the money. <laughs> they like to think that this is leverage in their programs. They're holding their faculty hostage in their units by saying, I don't want you to give them money because then I can't get them to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, these are the weird things that happen when you try to give away money. Outreach. Students develop undergraduate materials. They're required to be working on this with students and partnerships with outside programs. Graduate student money actually increases undergraduate retention. We all know that's where I'm looking this direction. We all know that that's where money is in institutions. It increases undergraduate retention with TAs and graduate students working on this. And when they're coming from integrated backgrounds, you know what? They can teach courses all over campus. So I'm going to end with, Fred, this is out to you, OK? So I'm the last speaker of this. I get to sort of give one, one back up to Fred. The Red Queen hypothesis, Fred, 
running to stay in place. This is a very hard effort. We need to think about how we're assessing these things. Times have changed so much that the first thing someone wants to do when they look at these programs, say, well, how is it better than what we're already doing? I heard yesterday about what are our controls and what? We're often running in place just to stay ahead of the game here. So here we go. Avoid bias and evaluation of programs and faculty. We have to think about how we are assessing programs in a different way. Don't you dare look at how you evaluate faculty for tenure and think you're going to say, well, when 20 years ago, no. 1.9, you know, citations per faculty member. I mean, these are projects that have a lot of faculty. On. I don't care where you are on that list. Student-centric. This is bottom up, not top down. I've heard from multiple students in the last two days and all the students that I have to work with all the time, it's really hard to enact change when you're a student. Student-centric means students are making decisions. Again, change is good, okay? Historical inertia, that's exactly what you just said. Historical inertia, we all know this. I walk around the departments at VCU all the time, I'm working with president, working with uh, vice provost, and Every once in a while, I get someone in the room that just says, I'm not interested. Why? Because that means I'd have to change what I'm doing. But is it better? Well, I don't care. I literally had a faculty member tell me uh, a few months ago, Brian, I got into this to be famous. I was like, how are you doing with that? <laughs> um, he's no longer the director of that center. Incentivize faculty and admin, undergraduate money, and retention, grants. Every graduate student that comes into these programs increases grants. We get these RCNs. Um, we're applying for an NRT. The grant numbers, the, the course of the cut, these are unique deliverables. Don't count. Look at what kind of impact they're having. And finally, diverse faculty and admin for students and careers. I'm matching students, for every individual that's coming to the program, I report back to the provost and say, you know how many female students I have in my program that are advised by female faculty members? Do you know how many underrepresented students I have that are mentored by underrepresented faculty members? Okay, you can't just pluck students out of space and say, here we go, we got them. Who are they being mentored by and how are we focused on that? So I'd like to end with that. These are not maybe new things you've heard all the time here, but this is a program that is actually doing these things, and 10 years in, we're successful. Tomorrow, maybe president leaves, goes somewhere else, we lose all our money, but that happens everywhere, right? We have data and we have assessment that show that, hey, if you want to ignore the typical metrics, this can work. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Diego Vargas. I'm from WPI. I'm a grad student. Uh, that's the university, actually, that I uh, was shown yesterday with the uh, leaves of spinach. And mm -hmm. well, um, I'm very interested in academia, and I'm still learning about what I need to do when I finish my uh, studies to go and become a faculty at some point. So uh, my university is not very big, but it's very interested in interdisciplinary work, at least for undergrads. So I think they do a very good job at that point. Uh, but not that much in grad studies, in, well, in grad school. So my question is, having some limited funding, what can I say to the dean, for example, to start with some interdisciplinary work uh, from all of the points you have listed? What do you think would be the most important thing to start with? I think of this from two perspectives. perspectives. The first thing is uh, you got to show them the money. You have to show them first that you can do and this is true for, you know, you want to you get into academia, you want to write proposals, you got to show me some preliminary results. So show them that when you interact with multiple faculty, what is the product that comes out of it? Show them from other units. It's, it, it's not about money always, it's about the relationships. After that, Again, it's about preliminary results showing that if you can interact and bring faculty together and create something that wasn't there before, that is interdisciplinary research. Not multi, inter. So that's my advice that I tell my own students is that whenever you're going off and getting jobs, the first thing you do, like I tried when I went to the human genetics group, is you walk in the door and you meet with individuals and you tell them, I want to listen to you talk. Let's go have lunch. Let's chat a little bit. 
I want to tell you how what I am an expert in can help you. And you bring people together and you find how those, those parts meet. This guy? I saw there was a hole here. I also saw that our chancellor has just joined us. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you mentioned about your president coming in and giving you all of this money so that you could <laughs> You could have. Good job, Fran. You could have. You could offer five years of support, no strings attached, to these students who were doing interdisciplinary research. And then you were mentioning about how some faculty were angry with you about this and all of that. But I imagine some faculty were angry with the president because you c he couldn't bring money from nowhere. He had to take money from somewhere. So I'd like to understand how your president did that and didn't get fired. <laughs> well, he retired, but yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I, I'm not familiar with what the structure of NC State is, um, but I'm gonna point to the upper left there to start and the upper right, and I would believe that in some way, shape, or form you have those two individuals in, in, in some way. Um, I'm also going to speculate that uh, depending upon what your funding model is, whether it's an RCM or whether, uh, meaning whether um, uh, dollars are generated from within programs or they're generated from above and then allocated at the beginning of your fiscal year, however that operates, that there is a budget that comes out of your vice president or whatever your office is for, for research and innovation that provides funding dollars to research centers and otherwise. This is a conservation of matter. I get that, where dollars come from. But this was an initiative that uh, I can say at VCU, and I'll hit you with just some quick math here, for every dollar that comes in, 70% of it goes back to the unit, and 30% of it goes into that individual's box up there in the upper left-hand corner. That money is then used to incentivize programs like this. So as you are putting dollars, think about the dollars that you're putting into each of those departments and each of those colleges individually, and then think about how you then ask those individuals to work together to write large grants. You're doing essentially the same thing we are, except I'm taking students and putting them into the program that are working among those different units and actually bringing in dollars the same way. So I am putting that funding back into each of those units. Because when I am giving out a five-year fellowship to a student, it's rewarding faculty in those units. So whether you want to give that money to that unit or whether I can give the money to you, it's having the same outcome. I understand that deans and departments, I mean, as an associate vice provost myself here, I understand that we do like to look within and say, what do I got so I can decide what I want to do? But this is a culture change. It absolutely is a culture change. It doesn't mean, hmm, what am I going without? Instead, it's, what am I getting now in addition? And this has to come from the top. You have to tell your kids sometimes, play together or else. Was that, was that okay? It's just like we rehearsed? Yes, sir. I'd like to emphasize something that's been brought up before, but I think is critical. And that is, when supporting graduate education to provide funds that go directly to the graduate students, and they can use them in very important ways, but one way that they can use them, uh, and that is to get out. In other words, to expand their horizons beyond that which occurs at their university. It's, it's not widely known. But for example, even here at NC State, the best people in the world on any particular subject are not necessarily here in our university. They're elsewhere. And students need to be able to make contact with those people. They should be part of, of, their, uh, of their education. Uh, we live in small tribal groups. They're distributed all over the world. You're disciplines are small tribal groups. The network of the people in that group is extremely important. Students need to become part of that 
right away. And the way they do that is they have to go places and meet other people. They have to go to international conferences. They have to get out of our institution. And you might point out, you say, gee, maybe the faculty need to do that more too. But that's <laughs> another conference. Um, what are the barriers? The barriers are money. So it needs to be specific. That's why giving the money to the student is a great investment. The, it takes extra barriers time. They're going to spend time doing that where the, some people feel they ought to still be at the bench. Um, and, and then another barrier is language. Uh, we don't emphasize language. We, our students, in some cases, don't have language requirements. And getting out sometimes around the world requires that they do that. And then there's politics. I just recalled that when I was a graduate student looking for a postdoc, if you wanted to go abroad to be supported by NIH, one application in a thousand was successful to get funding to go to a laboratory outside of uh, the United States. And I think we still have some political problems in terms of um, in, in that way. But what's important is to broaden the perspectives even more and have the students get out of their institution. Thank you. We, we um, help them get out at around four and a quarter years. <laughs> Great. And we have time for one more question and then we'll let Brian respond. So thanks, Brian. There were some great ideas and some things that are, seem to be really working. I would like to ask, with your grants, um, where you're looking at for getting funding, and then also with the system that you've set up, have you found that there are maybe greater opportunities for public-private partnerships within that? Great. Uh, so with grants, uh, we have been successful, again, with uh, at, at both levels. Uh, faculty, I think, are really, re I mean, for as much as NRT, and I, have, I had lots of problems with the IGART when, when I was in it, and I, I said this to, to uh, Fred yesterday, um, and this goes back to even what was just said about funding going to grad students. The problem I had with the IGAR is all of this money went to some of the biggest heavy hitters in the field at GW and NIH and, and Maryland at the time working on human evolutionary biology, big, big uh, 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 fields. And those individuals knew at that time that their investment was short because in five years that money was going to be gone and they were not going to get, they were, they were not going to get uh, renewed. And so they took that money and squirreled back into their holes. And I sat there as an eager thinking, oh, I'm going to get along with all these people. And they said, yeah, we've got our share. We're going to make sure we get our stuff done the next five years. So there are challenges to the way that that money is allocated that if we don't have institutional buy-in that shows that this is something we can invest in long term, that what we have decided we're moving into is you're seeing things like RCNs that are getting funded. Where is the, where did that question? Things like RCNs getting funded, collaborative, uh, eager, uh, you're getting uh, we have multiple NIH. I'm also on an NIH grant right now that's working on sequencing schizophrenia genomes. It's the largest funded genome project in the world right now. Um, I'm headed off to Iceland in the fall because that's where all the sequencing is happening. NIH came back with a really, really interesting and unfortunately killed our budget by like a half when it got funded. And they said, you know what? We'll keep all the money in there for personnel if you go out and find someone to get the sequencing costs. And we're like, mm, okay, that's like half a candy bar, right? Dad gives you a dollar, says you gotta share it. So we went out and actually got this group from Iceland to sequence everything, and we took all the money and put it into graduate students and postdocs and faculty. That's the new kind of deliverable that's coming out of these interdisciplinary. I'm an evolutionary biologist on the largest schizophrenia sequencing project in the world, and it's because these projects, and I said this recently, one of the responses in the grant said, one of the most unique ideas in this project is you have an evolutionary biologist on board. And I was like, really? That wasn't even unique 10 years ago. <laughs> so these are the kind of big grants that come out of these projects. Again, the Red Queen here, 
running to stay in place. The number of grants aren't going up necessarily. The amount of money isn't going up. But if you stop doing this, you actually start falling behind.